We welcome all of you tonight in the name of the Lord. Amen. Those of you who have joined us on live stream also. This will be our 81st lesson in our exposition of Genesis. Still got a few more lessons to go. After we've completed the text, I'm going to have, uh, I forget how many, two or three lessons on summarizing Genesis and uh, some of the ways it's referred to in the rest of Scripture and some of the concepts that are developed in Genesis. Tonight we commence the 50th chapter. And Joseph fell on his father's face and wept upon him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. And the physicians embalmed Israel. And forty days were fulfilled for him, for so are fulfilled the days of those which are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned for him threescore and ten days. And when the days of his mourning were past, Joseph spake unto the house of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found grace in your eyes, speak, I pray you, in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, lo, I, saying, Lo, I die in my grave which I have digged for me in the land of Canaan, there shalt thou bury me. Now therefore let me go up, I pray thee, and bury my father, and I will come again. And Pharaoh said, Go up, and bury thy father, according as he made thee swear. And Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house, and all the elders of the land of Egypt and all the house of Joseph and his brethren and his father's house, only their little ones and their flocks with their herds they left in the land of Goshen. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen, and it was a very great company. And they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond Jordan, and there they mourned with great and very sore lamentation. And he made a mourning for his father seven days. And when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning in the floor of Atad, they said, This is a grievous mourning to the Egyptians. Wherefore the name of it was called Abel Mizraim, which is beyond Jordan. And his sons did unto him according as he commanded them. For his sons carried him into the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah, which Abraham bought with the field for a possession of a burying place of Ephron the Hittite before Mamre. And Joseph returned into Egypt, he and his brethren, and all that went up with him to bury his father after he had buried his father. <coughs> Before we get into this uh, lesson, I want to I want to keep this keep a certain perspective. I'm not I won't read all these, but I list here 51 things that are recorded in which Jake, uh, Jacob was involved. 51 things, beginning with the struggle in the womb with Esau. And his birth, and then we don't hear anything for 25 years. We don't know anything about him. And all the things that are listed of him there. Now, Jacob lived 147 years. If you review these, the Lord or an angel appeared and spoke with Jacob 11 times. 11 times in 147 years. 
Now, a lunar year, which is the kind of year it's in the scriptures, 30 days, 147 years are translated into 52,920 days, 11 of which <laughs> God appeared to him. Calculating on an average basis, that'd be one time every 4,810 days or every 487th week, or every 160th month, or once every 14 years. <clears throat> I want you to keep in mind how faithful Jacob was, how he kept what was given him. With uh, We're talking about infrequency. It's staggering. Now, tell me, after, you, after just that brief review, how does this compare with being called into the fellowship of God's dear son? I'm saying this because there is no small number of professing Christians that are way behind Jacob in experience. Way behind Jacob in experience. But how does that compare? 11 times in 147 years. How does that compare with someone who's been called into the communion of the Holy Spirit? Yeah. Hmm. Or someone that has continual access yeah, to the throne of grace? Or someone who's being taught by Jesus himself on a regular amen, basis? Amen. Or was Jesus giving us an understanding? How does that... Or that we can walk in the light where most of their life was in the darkness. Yeah. Yeah. And yet in spite of those uh, very real attainable benefits, Jacob is light years ahead of the average Christian. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He lived more, a more focused life with a lot less revelation. Yes, See, this, I mean, you keep, my mind can't process this. <laughs> at all. He shaped his life around a very few promises. His entire life was lived around these very, very few promises, which I'll touch on a little later. See, but Jacob had the same faith his father Isaac had, who had the same faith his father Abraham had, which is supposed to be the same faith believers have. But there's no, I'm afraid, I blush to say it, but I'm afraid there's no similarity in the average professing Christian. I'm going to wax bold and say they don't have the faith of Abraham. They just don't. They just don't. Else they would live better and more conscious of God than they are. As a general role, role, rule, those who profess identity with the God of Jacob they are not living like the patriarchs lived. They confessed they were strangers and pilgrims and they lived as foreigners looking for a city that had foundation whose builder and maker is God and seeking a better country that is a heavenly. That's, that's, how, they, that's how they lived. That wasn't a goal. That's how they lived. Well, the record of these patriarchs must stare with this unquenchable desire Amen. with a kind of awareness Amen. that doesn't have to be pounded on the head all the time Amen. and exhorted all the time yes. and reminded all the time. Amen. This is very uncomely Amen. for the people of God. Amen. Now, as you look into this text, let's observe first Jacob's, Joseph's reaction to Jacob's death. You remember the uh, the Lord told Jacob Joseph would touch his eyes. Remember, remember we read that? He would touch his eyes or close them as they do in death. And that doubtless happened. He, he shut his eyes. Now, however, is this last glance at Jacob. A flood of blessed memories come over. Joseph, thanksgiving for the last, he spent the first 17 years of his life with Jacob, and now he spent the last 17 years of his life with Jacob, see? 
And the recollection of this, he wept upon him, yes. kissed him. But more is involved here than just natural affection. The promises delivered to Jacob, Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, were not delivered to anybody else. Yeah. If anybody else learned about these, it had to be handed down. Yes. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Well, knowing that puts a special significance on the death of Jacob. The divine commitment to multiply them, the land given to them, this sort of thing. This was this was given to Abraham, then to Isaac, then to Jacob, and he handed it down. He had, by the time of Moses, mm -hmm. hundreds of years later, the time of Moses, people knew. People knew about this. Now here's a go ahead. In Israel of that. Oh, before yeah. they went into the promised land. Yeah. That God is doing these things for you because of his promises Amen. to you. Yes. Amen. 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 Mm -hmm. Now it was up to the sons left to pass this on. And they did. They did pass it on. Now, now I want to I want to mention the few things that God told them. He didn't they didn't tell them very much. He didn't. It wasn't like in a big book. It said Abraham's seed would be a stranger in the land that's not theirs. He told them they'd be afflicted four hundred years. He told them God would judge that nation, bring Israel out with a great substance. He said they'd come out in the fourth generation. So you, people kind of keep, keep track of this. And all families of the earth would be blessed. That coupled with their seed would be as the stars of the heaven. This is, this is what they had. They didn't have one syllable about after they died. None of them. If unless you want to say we're gathered into his people, unless you, unless, you, unless you want to use that. But there was no opening up of life after death. In fact, there was no opening up of life after death until the gospel came. Life and immortality were opened up by the gospel. So people were in the dark. A few saints had some ideas about it, but they were very abbreviated. Yet these promises <laughs> that were all temporal that they received provided enough incentive for them to be faithful. Amen. Amen. I want to show you how potent the Word of God is, see? The last man on earth to hear these promises has left the earth and there's kind of a void yeah. created by his absence. Now I've become especially aware of this kind of thing in recent years, of course, as, uh, those of you, most of you should know Laverne Morris. He was here, visited with us a couple of times. He's went on to be with the Lord. But this caliber of people is fading from the scene. We do not have as a rule, as a rule, people of this caliber leading the Church of God. I'd like to say we do, but we don't. We've got a bunch of people that are, have learned secondhand, and the only thing they know is what they got from somebody else, and they're not too sure about that. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. so I kind of I fellowship a little with Joseph here. Man of this caliber, taken away from the earth. But these things were passed on to the children faithfully. Now, I want, to, I want to bear down on this for a moment. That there are matters that we've been kept in trust of that must be passed on to our children. Yes. They must be passed on. Let's call an end to Bible stories and Bible games. I mean, I'm not against them, but I pertinent am. Teach your children, start when they're young. Start when they're young. That death is the result of sin. Teach it to them. Tell, see, we've been told a lot more than they were told. It's got to be passed on. By mouth, it has to be passed on. God is our helper. Ingrain that in their thinking as much as possible. 
tell them that nothing was able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. See, these are things that we've been told has got to be passed, that Jesus is interceding for us. Don't, you may think, well, they won't understand it. Well, give it a try. I'm telling you, they understand more than you think. Yes. Every temptation comes with a way of escape. Teach them this so they don't have to learn it when they're 40 years old. Amen. Teach them that after we've suffered for a while, God will perfect us. So suffering doesn't take them unawares. Teach them this. Teach them. I don't know of any youth program that does this. After we've suffered a while, God will perfect us. Teach, teach them that the knowledge of the earth is going to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. The knowledge of the Lord is going to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. God's going, to, God's going to dim it. He's going to have the victory. Teach them that Jesus is coming back in glory and what that means. Teach them that Satan, the beast, and the false prophet are all going to be cast in a lake of fire. They're all going to lose and they're all going to be cast in a lake of fire. Teach them that. Teach them that the earth's going to be destroyed by fire. Teach them that the dead are going to be raised incorruptible. Along that line, some years ago, a brother in Indiana, his girl, Eden, I forget if it was Eden or Susanna, but they were, they were young. They were talking four or five years old. And uh, she had broken her arm. It was in a cast. She came up to me. She's a little, little preschool. She said, Brother Given, see my arm here? My daddy told me that when the dead are raised, I'm getting a new arm. Yeah. Now, see, the Jews did teach their children this way. They did teach their children this way. Told them all these things. Teach them that faithful stewards will be praised by God. Eat with men do or not. That every man is going to give an account of himself to God. Everybody. The time's coming when the saints are going to take the kingdom. Teach them. Teach them that. Teach them that Babylon's going to fall. Amen. What's false going to collapse? What's false can't survive. It's going to ultimately collapse. If it's wrong, it's going to fall. Teach them that. Teach them there'll be a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. And that those in Christ are strangers and pilgrims on the earth and they'll never really feel at home here. Amen. These are, and a number of other things, as Luke would say, is are surely believed among us. Yes. You're talking about Jacob's death here. Begin after the time that they, it's going to be 400 years that's right. before Amen. God speaks to anybody that's, again. That's right. According to the scripture record. That's right. 400 years. Mm. And so these things that have been promised to the fathers and they're being passed from generation yes. to generation to generation, critical. Amen. Amen. So Amen. that Moses would know about these things when he yeah. came on the scene. Amen. He would remember these promises. Amen. And the Lord would say, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, Amen. and Jacob. Amen. And so Moses knew who he was talking Amen. to, who he was listening to, he when he heard it. those words. That's powerful stuff. 400 Amen. years. That's powerful. Yeah. That means there's like at least 10 generations, all they knew was bondage in Egypt. In one of the lessons, how that uh, we're talking about God had established the twelve tribes as one, as one of the reasons that He He had abruptly uh, stopped. Yeah. Uh, do you remember talking about that? Any? I was see if you could refresh that. Uh, yeah. They well, they were, they were custodians of the truth of God. He localized them. He isolated them from the world. He revealed things to them, and the only way, the only way anybody else had of knowing anything substantive about God was for a Jew to tell him. Yeah. Amen. There wasn't any other way. Yeah. Someone said, they might have had the scriptures. They had to go to the synagogue to find out what they meant. Yeah, that's right. And he still is, he's graduated the amount of data, so to speak, yes. but he's handed it over to the church is a pillar and ground of the truth. If they don't pass it on, yeah. it's not going to be passed on. Amen. It's not given to the government or somebody else. Yeah. So we're, we are even more responsible than the, than the Jews were. But when, if the Jews hadn't passed this down, not only would they have not known about the deliverance of Egypt, they would not have any faith idea about a Messiah. Uh -huh. 
And think how little actually was said about the Messiah. Comparatively so. <laughs> so enough said that we're responsible for our offspring to be conversant yes. with what God has promised his people. Amen. And it, you can't just always just expose them to some nice little ditties about people that live long ago. I mean, it's got to go. You can do that. Nothing wrong with that. We're, we're not criticizing anybody for doing that. We're saying it's got to be more than that. Yeah. That's not enough to keep your children. Mm -hmm. Amen. Your children will not remain faithful because they heard some Bible stories. This is not Amen. how it's done. They've got to be told the promises of God from young up so that yes. when they're Samuel, they know what an ephod is. Yes. Know what it is to get out of bed and serve God. Yes. When a child, when they're 12 year old Jesus, they know where to go when they go to Jerusalem. They didn't go sightseeing. Amen. See? Yeah. They were raised up. This, uh, Kimberly, given when my uh, children, my sons came down to visit. And they went back up north. They, they, they testified that they had been to some place that where the people actually knew God. And they knew where they were going up there, that, that they were just pretending. Yeah. Nobody told them this. Yes. They, but they, see, they, they saw. They can tell if you're alive yeah. or not. Mm -hmm. Amen. Really given. Yes. <clears throat> the thought occurred to me um, at a, a workshop that we had attended for homeschooling. And this issue came up about about uh, fairy tales and I, I thought about this why why are there so many children that <laughs> grow up in the church and then when they get older they they fall away or they don't they don't continue in their walk with the Lord and I thought about this how how the marketing technique has been to make books in a fairy tale manner mm -hmm. yeah. that have to do with the scripture yeah. to so to appeal to the younger children mm -hmm. But then when they grow up, it's just a fairy tale book. It's not, mm -hmm. there's yes, nothing you're, real about you're it. You're right. Mm -hmm. It's not, it, it's just like Cinderella or whatever mm -hmm. else fairy yeah. tale there mm -hmm. is. Yeah. And and this is, I think it's a master stroke of the enemy. Well, amen. To get mm -hmm. people to do this so that so that children don't have the ability or the understanding that they need in order amen. to survive. Mm -hmm. Remember the law said, teach of your children, your children's children. Yes, amen. It was specified that. This is why, see, because mm -hmm. you cannot, faith cannot pass from one generation to another, but knowledge can, yes. and awareness of the promises of God. So Joseph falls out of Jacob's face, he weeps, tremendous mm -hmm. loss. Then Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. Now, for Joseph, embalming no doubt meant more than it did for the Egyptians. For the Egyptians, they had a concept of life after death, which was uh, borrowed from the truth, so to speak. They believed that the bodies of the dead were it, the bodies of the dead were preserved, transferred over to the next life. And so they mummified them or dried them out so they could last until then. And then they would bury with them all kind of things that they would use on the other, mm -hmm. on the other side. He commanded, but for, but for Joseph, there was a sort of a dignity. There was a, there was a dignity assigned to the human body because God made it. And then now he's he's bought it. Mm -hmm. Beside making it, he's bought it now by Christ. So there's a certain dignity to the human body. Yeah. And so he, the embalming was more associated with that than with a, just a mere custom. Uh -huh. The Jews came to practice a certain formality in the handling of the dead. I don't know when it started, but it was early on. The burial of Jesus kind of makes you aware of this. They took the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. See, so they developed this, the hanging of the body based on they knew God created the body. See, 
is seen in the burying of Lazarus, the brother of Mary and uh, Martha. He that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave clothes, see, and his face round about with a napkin. I'm showing that they, they this practice of handling the body, it, it grew up among the Jews. Not because they were superstitious, but because they had more understanding about the origin of the body and they respected it. Even when Ananias died, they, they wound him up and carried him out and buried him. That was one of the first jobs the deacons had. Wind up the dead, wrap them up, and bury them. The reason for the Egyptians embalming of their dead, of course, was quite, quite different. But I gather that little smattering of knowledge they had about handling the body was an example of having the nature of things contained in the law written on their hearts, as Paul mentioned in Romans 2. They did by nature something that we have more information. There's sort of a sense, see, see there's, there's no excuse for anybody not pursuing God. Because every person has this built in their, in their person this idea, and they kind of know intuitively that there's a God and this sort of thing, and now their, their object is to pursue that, <clears throat> pursue that. Now, here's something to consider that while this that I just mentioned is, should be obvious, due note should be paid to the customs of the people who have been under the election, direction, and tutelage of God. Now. The people that have been in close proximity to God, I am particularly interested in their customs. Assuming that they took advantage of this nearness to God and they put together some things that were in the scriptures, if, anybody, if we're interested in anybody's customs, it ought to be those people, not, uh, not people of the heathen religions of the world. We know that Job, who lived about the time of Abraham, he had some intuitive knowledge. He said, though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. See, he didn't have a lot of detail, but he, he sensed that. I think he sensed that because he lived close to God and he's kind of picked up on this. Yeah. David said, as for me, I'll be whole I face when I, in, righteous, in righteousness I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. See that? They knew that the Burying the body wasn't the end of the body. That's why they handled it respectful. They knew this isn't the end for the body. It's just the end of its existence in the world. They saw more in death than the Egyptians did. But not only uh, did Jacob do this, but he knew his father wanted to be buried in Canaan. So he didn't want that body to rot because it was going to be a, over two months uh -huh, yes. in a desert climate. Mm -hmm. yeah. So mortification would have yeah. set in, yeah. see? And he wanted to preserve that so yeah. the, he could be buried in Canaan. Amen. Now, 40 days were fulfilled. The 40 days, this was the time it took for embalming. Somewhere in here I give the process for embalming it's I, I, it's too <laughs> detailed to read but they, they were they were scientific the Egyptians were they knew things about embalming and this it's, it's still a marvel their embalming is still a marvel to this day they'll find mummies that are, their shape and form and everything is the same it's just it's, it's hard and rock hard 40 days were for the process, so he's waiting. See, he's going to bury. Mm -hmm. See the patience. You got to see the patience here. Yeah. Amen. I don't think a lot of Americans could wait this long yeah. to bury a body. Uh -huh. <laughs> Forty days it took to embalm it, and the uh, that's how long the the uh, embalming process took. But then the Egyptians they mourned for seventy days, which I gather that 
four, that the 40 days was the first, and they mourned 30 days another month after that. So they mourned 70 days. Yeah. Amen. Now, yes. Yeah, it's becoming a trend in the day we live in. You know how patient he was. He waited, and yet when we were up north, Carol Mahone died. You remember the Mahones? Yes, oh yes. Anyway, they didn't even have a wake, and they didn't even have a funeral. They had just a graveside. So they they could they, they couldn't even endure that. Yeah. But see, this is this is a, a custom that's beginning in in, in, in our yeah. country that, that they they don't want to deal with this. Yeah. It's just a thing of convenience. See, convenience yes. is is kind of dominated society. Convenience. Mm. Mm. Seventy days they mourn. Now these are the Egyptians that that thought that a, a Hebrew was an abomination to eat with a Hebrew. See, uh -huh. when they came in, yeah. yeah. This is what they thought. But now, now. Something had happened in the interim. That right. In the 17 years Jacob was there, they weren't abominating yeah. Hebrews. Yeah. He'd behaved himself wisely, and he yes. gained a, evidently gained a good reputation during that time. Hmm. And we learned that from this that there had been nothing in all of Jacob and Joseph's tenure in Egypt. They did nothing that would cause the people to disrespect them. Hmm? They did nothing to cause the disrespect. They lived for God. They kept their faith, kept to their way, kept their customs, but they gave no reason to, for the people to disrespect them. This doubtless they respected Joseph because they learned about him when he administered the food program, and they probably learned a lot about him that he was a considered and a wise man. But there had been nothing in either Joseph or Jacob that would have justified any respect to them, disrespect to them. Now here's something to ponder as you think about these things. The people of God are admonished to live like this. Romans 12, 17 says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest, honest, honest in the sight of all men. Don't dare let there be anything in your life that even the world knows is wrong. I just don't. That's all. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works and doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be as be ashamed, having no evil thing to say about you. So don't speak. Don't live. Don't act. Don't conduct your life so that it brings unjust criticism from the world, uh, so that it brings just criticism from the world. Mm -hmm. Having a good conscience, the scripture says, that whereof they speak evil of you, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed who falsely accuse you mm -hmm. for, for your good conversation you know, in Christ. So we live in such a manner as no criticism can be justified. It becomes apparent that is false. It's tragically true that there are still some people who choose to wear the name of Christ who cause his name and his truth to be blasphemed and maligned. And this is inexcusable. Thus it's written, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you. See, that's, this is a serious business. Young men are admonished. In all things, showing that self a pattern of good works and doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned. So we are not to leave a bad taste in the mouth Amen. of sinners. Amen. Not because of our conduct. Maybe they don't like our doctrine, they don't agree with I understand that we'll suffer persecution because of our faith and for Jesus' sake, but not because of bad works. Not because of that. Let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or, as it gets kind of personal here, or as a busybody in other men's matters. So just uh, keep your nose out of the other person's business. I know that more professing Christians knew this. Now the time passes, the days of the morning are past, and Joseph speaks to the house of Pharaoh. He doesn't go directly to Pharaoh. He speaks to the 
media areas there in the house. It says, say this in the ears of Pharaoh. This has got to be said directly to Pharaoh. Don't tell somebody else to tell somebody else. When you tell Pharaoh this, that my father made me swear, saying, lo, I die in my my grave which I have digged for me in the land of Canaan there shalt thou bury me. Now he's going to ask Pharaoh, let me, let me go do what I promised my father I would do. I, Joseph was the governor over all Egypt. He doubtless could have done this without probably encountering a lot of difficulty, but the Pharaoh had already told him that he'd be head over all his house, and over according to thy words, shall all my people be ruled only in the throne. Yeah. Will I be greater than you? All right, this burying his father, this didn't fall under the administration of the food campaign. Yeah. This didn't come under that. This was a matter of the go, and he recognized that. See, he didn't assume he had more authority than he really had. Yeah. Yeah. People get in some trouble here. They assume they've got more authority and more power than they really have. Yeah. They extend into borders without inquiring of the Lord, see, what to do. This does not have to do with, as I mentioned, with storing or contributing or distributing food. It was a, it was a throne matter. Yeah. Now, you will experience things like there's some things just by virtue of you being in Christ, there's some things you can just do just for that, just because of that, because you're in Christ. Jesus. There's other things you've got to inquire. You've got to say like David, shall I go up? There's things like that you got to inquire. And blessed is the person who, who knows the, dis the distinction. Another example of this is Esther. She was married to the king. This is his wife, his preferred wife. She had this special thing about the Jews she was going to present to the king, her husband. And she knew her domestic role carried no weight here. Yeah. Uh -huh. This was a matter of the throne. So just because you're the king's wife, that didn't, that didn't swing things one way or the other on this matter here. Uh -huh. So she dressed a special way. She prepared herself a special way and went in before the king. And she knew he, even though she was his wife, he had to hold out the scepter, which said, all right, you can come in. He held out the scepter, and she pled her case. But I want you to see, she recognized yes. there was a place that she did not have liberty to proceed on her own. Uh -huh. And the same, the same is true of us as believers, every one of us. There are some areas of life we do not have a right to proceed on our own. Mm -hmm. We've got to inquire yes, amen. and ask the Lord what to do. Yeah. And you're close enough that you can pick up on the answer. You've, you've encountered things in your life like this, and uh, I just wanted to encourage you to continue to do that. So I've said it's similar with believers. When we appear before God, it's not on our own merit. It's not because we're sons of God. It's because we're in Christ. It's because of His Son. Amen. That's how we appear before God at all times. If you appear and make a request, it must be in the name of Christ. Jesus made this plain. It yeah. must be in his name. You must ask because of him. Yeah. Your, your petition should be in harmony with who Jesus is and what he's doing. Yeah. In his name you come. Now, I've heard a lot of prayers that aren't offered in Jesus' name. To their own master, they stand or fall, but I wouldn't dare to pray and leave Jesus out of my prayer. And he said to them, um, but Jesus, you know, incidentally, I don't think any here have this practice. I wouldn't say it's wrong to utter a petition to Jesus. Stephen said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. I mean, so it's not a strict rule, but as a rule, Jesus said, you shall ask, you shall ask me nothing. That's what he was told his disciples, John 16, 20, whatever it means, I... We need to learn it and abide by it. You shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. So yes, there is a protocol in coming to God. It's wrong to like make a, a legalistic law out of it. This is something that comes to the understanding. And the closer you are to God, the more you'll find yourself doing this. Now, if I found favor, he said, 
if you see no reason, to, no need to rebuke me or correct me, if I found favor in your sight, he appeals to the king's favor. He doesn't appeal to, the, to a law. He doesn't say, now you said that I could. He doesn't. He appeals to his favor. Now this is a good thing to learn to pray this. To appeal to God's favor and to his will. If you're pleased to, you know. Believe me, it'll change the way you pray. If you really are conscious of this and you filter your prayers through the good pleasure of God, and through the nature of God, it'll change what you pray for and how you pray for it. I pray thee. Well, he doesn't mince words. He's going to, he's going to present his petition and do so strongly. Now, <clears throat> because of Joseph's excellent reputation and the honor of his father. He was, granted his, he was granted his request. Now there's something to learn here. Between being born again and death, or the coming of the Lord, we have opportunity to confirm the sincerity of our hearts. That's how much time you got. From the time you're born again, to either when you leave the world, or when Jesus comes, you've got that period of time to prove that you're sincere. God doesn't take it for granted. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't take it for granted. Yeah. You shouldn't take it for granted. Mm -hmm. We got that period of time now to prove just as surely as the period of time Joseph spent that period of time at 17 years, mm -hmm. he proved he was faithful. Yeah. There was no question about it. Pharaoh could trust Joseph to do exactly what he said he was going to do and no more. See, he had yeah. that period of time to prove that. There are ex extensive responsibilities involved in, pre in preparing for disembarking from the world. And you've got your lifetime to, you've got that period of time to crucify your flesh. Yeah, yeah. That this has got to get done Amen. between the time you're born again and when you leave the world or Jesus comes. This has got to be done in that time. Mm -hmm. If it's not done, it's not ever going to be done. Crucify the flesh, denying ungodliness, worldly lusts, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord, presenting our bodies a living sacrifice to God, doing whatever we do heartily to the Lord, running the race with patience is set before us, proving to be a faithful steward, having to maintain the fervent love of the brethren, not quenching or grieving or resisting the spirit, keeping our affections on the things above, growing up into Christ in all things. See, everybody knows this is in the Bible, most people anyway. But this has got to get done. Yes. These are not like just goals that we kind of dream about doing. This has got to be done. Yeah. And God be praised that he gives us, a, he allots us, my times are in your hands. Amen. Well, that involves more than you determine when I come in, you determine when I go out. My times are in your hands. This is a time you've given me. Mm -hmm. See, some people only have a short time to get ready. Yeah. Yeah, they die at an early age. Mm -hmm. Just got a short time. Other people live a long time. And it's a little, more, a little bit more difficult because as the older you get, there's temptations to retire and step off the road. And, but all this has got to get done because just as surely as Joseph had to appear before Pharaoh, we're going to have to appear before God. And when we do, we if we can't, if he can't say, well done, good and faithful servant, we're not going to get yeah. the promise. Yeah. Now he get, he's granted the right to go, and he goes with a tremendous entourage. He goes uh, to Canaan, went to bury his father. Now, I, I like the language. It doesn't say he went to the funeral. But he went to bury mm -hmm. his father. Yeah. There be weeping and mourning, but the objective of the trip to Canaan was to bury his father. Mm -hmm. oh. Jacob had already been gathered to his people. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
yet they're burying his father. You gotta pick, <laughs> gotta pick up on the language or develop this a little bit. But he'd already been gathered to his people. I want him, when he died on his bed, the scripture says he was gathered to his people. Now they're handling the residue of his person considerably more than 70 days later. Now the same thing said of Abraham, he was gathered unto his people and then his sons buried him after he was gathered to his people. Same was true of Isaac, he was gathered unto his people then buried later when Jacob and Esau buried him. Now why do I say that? Because soul sleepers say that when the man is when buried that the soul is, is buried there also. With what they teach. We had a man, all, all of you know this, all of you know this man, but because I respect the man, I won't mention his name. He said during one of our Friday night meetings something that God had showed him. And it was that the Holy Spirit will quicken your mortal body. And what that meant was when you lay the body in the in the grave, the Holy Ghost goes in the grave with the body. Oh yeah, I'm telling you the truth. And that when the resurrection, the Holy Ghost brings the body out. God showed that to him, he said. And we had we had to correct him on that, but then that being the case, you couldn't be gathered to your people before before you were buried. See, these people say that he gathered to his people meant he was buried in the, in the grave like the other people were buried. That's what they say this means. So they, but that's not the case because he, the chronology is quite clear. He's gathered to his people, then later, sometime later, he was buried. <laughs> and he took this, uh, Jacob took this large entourage with him. Uh, he took all the servants of Pharaoh That'd be his slaves and this sort of thing. Obviously, probably to attend to their needs on the way, this sort of thing. Then he took uh, the elders of his house. That'd be the wise men, senators, and leaders in the palace or possibly even the city. And then all the elders of the land of Egypt, the senators and sub-rulers and so forth, and all the provinces of Egypt. They all went with him. And the Hebrews who went with him, all of the house of Joseph and his brethren, and he had a lot of servants and that sort of thing. And his father's house, only the little ones and the herds remained in Goshen. Now when Jacob first came into Canaan, he came out 70 souls. But it had already the numbers had begun to change. It's 17 years later, and in Genesis 47, 28, it says, Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt in the country of Goshen, and they had possessions therein, and grew and multiplied exceedingly. So in that 17 years, there was like a population explosion, and all of, the, all of those people <laughs> went with Joseph to Canaan. So this was a, I got a picture here I found, and, and you can see the, the crowd winding up through, winding through the hills as far as you can see. This was a tremendous aggregation of people traveling to uh, the burial of Jacob. A very great company, the scripture says. A very great company. Very meaning exceeding and abundant. Great meaning massive and abundant and numerous and company meaning army, company, great body of people. Well, it must have been an impressive position, yeah. procession. Sort of reminds me of how it's going to be with the, with the body of Christ. Uh -huh. Except we're not going to go to bury. We're, right. we're not going to bury Jesus, bury Jesus. We're going to see him. But yeah. the vastness of the number. It's a multitude which no man can number. The vastness of the number that's going to be have an abundant interest into the everlasting kingdom of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is staggering to consider. This indicates that a, a, a latter condition that is greater than a former one. Now, it's the principle. One. This is how God operates. The latter is greater than the former. That's, that's just the principle now that God operates under. 
The 54th chapter of Isaiah, which follows the 53rd chapter about Christ's atoning death, talks, it says, Sing, sing, thou barren, O barren, thou didst not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou didst did not travail for more of the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife. He, Jake, Jacob had more when he left than when he came. Abraham had more when he left than when he came. Same with Isaac is same with the body of Christ. The latter condition is going to be larger than the former. The promise of the Father to the Son is arresting. He said, Ask of me. Ask of me, I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. See? <laughs> Tremendous multiplication. The psalmist said, All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. See? This is this is just this is just as surely going to happen as this record that we're reading about. Amen. Just see at a day of Pentecost, which by modern standards was a tremendous ingathering of souls. But from this perspective, it was just a few grains. Pentecost was the harvest of first fruits. That's what the, that's what it celebrated. The harvest of first fruits, the, the grains that got ripe the quickest, which was a few, those were reaped. That's what happened at Pentecost. A few, a few, comparatively few ripe grains were reaped. Three thousand right away in a few days. Five thousand more in the multitude. That was just a, that was just an initial small harvest. There's going to be a bigger harvest. A large harvest. It's going to fulfill all the promises of God. Well, they traveled. The distance was about 300 miles from Egypt to where they went. About 300 miles. This tremendous caravan. I mean, we'd think it to be something. If we had 10 cars that all drove together to Tulsa, we'd think that was that was quite a feat. Just that. We'd probably someone could probably get lost along the way. As a matter of fact. But uh, that's what happened. They came to the threshing floor of Atad. It's the only place in the Bible Atad is mentioned. That, that word is nowhere else. This is it. The word Atad, we understand, means thorn tree. I've got some pictures over there of thorn trees. They were used to protect areas like a fence and I get that this threshing floor was protected this is one of the distinctions of it it was protected the field of the threshing floor of Atad it was a large round field where the animals stomped out the grain and the people gathered it up and winnowed it and so forth it was we understand a large a large significant area and this was a particular field and it specifies that it was the other side of Jordan that is it was on the Canaan side <laughs> it was on the Canaan side when you're in Canaan the other side of Jordan is outside of Canaan yeah, that's right. but this was inside they took it in it had to be a threshing floor to accommodate this big crowd it had to be in in Canaan And then they lamented for seven more days. Joseph, Joseph had a lament seven more days because of the spiritual impact of this. Now there are a few, there are a few glimpses we are given of the burial of significant people. Not many, but there are, this is one here. Jesus, we're given some details about his burial. The anointing of it, even his body was anointed in preparation for it. That's how significant the burial was. His burial was obviously very significant. He was buried after the manner of the Jews, not, not after the manner of the Egyptians or the Romans. It was the Jews. Peter referred to Christ's burial as his body resting in hope on the day of Pentecost. And the burial of Jesus is an essential part of the gospel. Burial. Now, truth is never associated with something that's meaningless. Yeah. Yeah. 
this is something people got to see. If burial, if whether you're buried or not is not to mean anything, and it's not significant, burial would never be connected with Je with Jesus, who died and rose again for our justification. It would never be connected with that if it was a meaningless event. It is not a meaningless event at all. <clears throat> As I mentioned, the journey to Egypt was about 300 miles. If they traveled at about 20 miles a day, which I understand would be a standard, it'd take about 15 days to get there. Do it they're going through a desert, remember, yeah. to get there. And they mourned, when they got there, they mourned the great, very sore lamentation. And the, uh, the Egyptians, the Canaanites heard it. Because you have to be in some of these countries to know what wailing is about. Sometimes you'll see it on the news. You'll see it on the news. Mm -hmm. Some tragedy will happen in some of those eastern worlds, and, they, and they'll, you'll see them what wailing is. This is what they did. This is what they did. See, we've got all refined. We don't do much wailing here. Here, griping is the thing that's done, but they wailed. And the, and the Canaanites heard it. <laughs> I don't know whether I, it, I don't know if they knew about Jacob. Jacob had lived there, you know, for 17 years. I don't know if they knew this was the one that was a former inhabitant or not, but they heard this, this morning. And you notice that Joseph didn't say, now don't hide your mourning, don't, don't appear before men to mourn, let them mourn. See, a lot can be learned from professing believers by their response to sorrow mm -hmm. as well as their response to grief. Amen. Now, I know some people think it's wrong to cry at a funeral. Because mm. I have been at funerals where they were very sad. But when someone leaves the battlefield, there's two sides of the coin. We're, we're, we rejoice because they're with the Lord. It's just that we don't have examples of people rejoicing in death in Scripture. I'm sure they knew they knew as much about it as we do. That they finished their course, that's them. But the morning is that they left a gaping hole. They were a part of the army, and the army is not as strong as it was before. Where's I? Where I see? I'm living to see this happen. I'm living to see the church grow weak because of. The strong people are either retired and put out to pasture or they pass away. And it has had an impact on the church. It's had an impact on it, but people can't see it. They redefine leaders and raise up leaders after their own lusts, and that's how they get around it, see. They said this, this, was, this really must be a grievous morning. The Egyptians' morning here. This must really be. They even named the place, gave that. Pleasant feel of name of special name Abel Miserium, which means Abel Miserium means mourning of the Egyptians. Yeah. All right, here's a here's a piece of land in Canaan, and now it's identified with the Egyptians. The piece of land in Canaan identified with the Egyptians. <laughs> Well, it's kind of a mirror you've got to see that in the world there's a, there's a, there are places identified with the Lord, with the people of the Lord. Not just in this case, in our case, it's not just for the mourning and groaning, we groan and being in pain together. It's, it's not that alone. These are sanctified places. When these Jews went to Canaan, before they inhabited Canaan, if they wanted to be uh, have some holy recollections, they made their place way to this burying place. That was that was a place that was set apart. That's the way we are. See, we're in the world, we're not of the world. We try and find places where where the Lord is resident and we are known for the Lord. So the idea, again, the plot, plot of ground in Canaan was now identified with the Egyptians. <laughs> Interesting. 
And you'll find the world will sense it. The world will sense this. The world will not want to be in territory that's been claimed by the saints. Oh, you they don't want that. They may say, well, that's that's where that's where they go. That's what they do. But they don't want to be. They don't want to be identified with themselves. From this, we learn the importance and the wisdom of viewing our lives with spiritual epochs in mind. Now, a person's got to be careful not to be judgmental here. But I think in America, people's lives are associated with too much trivia. I don't think enough is made of spiritual epochs, being born again, when you're born again, when the eyes of your understanding were opened up, or when some great truth became clear to you, the day star dawned, see? Those, there should be special remembrances of those type of things, and the range is made so you, if you had to formalize it some way so you don't forget it. That's what these saints did. They'd raise up a pillar, you know, or something. They wouldn't forget these epochs. But see, there's some people that have had tremendous experiences with God, and they forgot them. And they let them pass by the wayside. Every person has to do what they're going to do themselves. We can't dictate to anybody. But I found it's profitable to rehearse spiritual epochs. And I found that if I didn't do this, I found myself forgetting them. And maybe I'd be stirred up, my memory stirred up by somebody else or something I heard, or, but I hadn't kept that thing fresh in my mind. Then it says the sons did as they were commanded. According to he, Jacob commanded him, for his sons carried him in the Canaan and buried him uh -huh. in the cave of the field of Machpelah, which Abraham brought with the field of possession, and so forth. Him. Now remember, Jacob said, bury me. Yeah, that's right. He said. And Joseph said, embalm his father. I noticed that Jacob didn't say, bury my body, although that, that is what they did. <laughs> they did bury my body. Now it does say that when John the Baptist was beheaded, the disciples took up the body and buried it. When it was told Jesus, he left public life for a, for a while. Huh? You remember that kid? He left public life for a while. That was his reaction to the passing of this great man. What went you out for to see? A reed shaken in the wind? No, as of men born of woman, there's not been one greater arise than John the Baptist. Amen. When he died, even the Lord, even the Son of God himself withdrew yeah. from the multitude. See, that's the impact that the absence of godly yes, people. Amen. I take it from this that John the Baptist was a great source of encouragement to Jesus, because he was the man that introduced him to the mm -hmm. introduced him to the world. And you'll remember that uh, the rich man in Lazarus, the account Jesus gave of the rich man in Lazarus, says that Lazarus died, and the angels carried him mm -hmm. to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man died, and it says he was, they buried him. <laughs> it's a kind of a play on words, but they buried, they buried him. He was very much alive and conscious in hell, but they buried him, but they carried Lazarus him, they carried him away to angels' bosoms. Uh, considering, considering someone who suffered the punishment of death, Moses said, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him. <laughs> all right, I want, to, I want to develop this, an overview of the human constitution. What constitutes a person? What constitutes them? There's some confusion on this matter. There's a sense in which a part of the person counts for the whole of the person. Man is made up of body, or in order of priority, spirit, soul, body. The three comprise 
a person or an entity. Thus the body is considered him. In another sense, the soul can be said, considered him, for God made every man a living soul. And often men are referred to as souls. Additionally, men, especially departed ones, are called referred to as spirits. And God is also referred to as the father of spirits. So there you have all three, body, soul, spirit, or spirit, soul, and body. The three of them comprise a person. And all three of them must be redeemed. The soul, because of the triple nature of man, salvation is calculated to touch every part of man. From the standpoint of life in the world, sanctification is intended for the entire man, spirit, soul, and body. We are therefore read of the salvation of souls. The rational, expressive part of our persons. A soul, as I understand, is a, is a seat of rationality and expression. The human spirit, our spirits are also saved, being joined to the Lord. He that's joined to the Lord is one spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says, it speaks of our essential person. This is our focused identity, for want of a better term. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, Paul wrote, be with your spirit. Now, men have a difficult time distinguishing between soul and spirit. There have been a lot of arguments about it. But it is a complex matter. As a matter of fact, only the Word of God can distinguish between the two. But it can. It can divide asunder between soul and spirit, which means there are two, there are two separate things, yet it's very difficult to see their separateness. And the body, that's the part of us it's most closely aligned with the world, uh -huh. yeah. our body. It's been excluded in totality from the kingdom of God. Yeah. Flesh and blood, which, which yeah. constitutes the body, cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Yeah. Notwithstanding, notwithstanding, because the body is integral to our persons, mm -hmm. salvation includes the redemption mm -hmm. of our body. Amen. See, because it's a part of our essential mm. person. This mortal buddy, must put on immortality. Yeah. Salvation will not be completed until that's done. Yeah. Till the whole spirit, soul, and body mm -hmm. is in a redeemed condition, uh -huh. the, the salvation will not be complete until that, until that time. At that time, when the bodies chase the resurrection of the dead, for the first time in all their experience, mm -hmm. the people who are in Christ will be saved spirit, soul, and body. Amen. You can, with all this in mind, this affects what you think about burial, and this, it affects what you think about that. Amen. While in the world we live, so to speak, with an enemy in the house. Mm -hmm. yeah. We find a law that I, when I would do good, evil is present with me, and it's resident, it, it's concentrated in your body. Uh -huh. That's why you got to keep under your body, bring it into subjection. That's why you have to do that. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? See, it's this body. This is, this is really all Satan has to work with. Amen. Now, at this point, I want to get. Now, this is my own understanding. I will not. I would not presume to oppress this on anyone else beyond their ability to see it. Mm -hmm. But that this represents my own understanding. Mm -hmm. I understand the new man to be a special creation of God. His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. It's not the modifying of the human spirit. The new man is not the regeneration of the human spirit. It's a new man altogether. The difference is as long as they are in the body, the redeemed have two contradicting natures. One of them must dominate. Both of them cannot do so simultaneously. The new man which alone has been joined to the Lord and is been joined to the Lord and is one spirit with him. Mm -hmm. Now here's how I see that this is his train of thought. I'm just in the process of developing myself, but I believe this is correct. The body 
Uh, that's, that doesn't change till the resurrection. The soul, that doesn't change until the resurrection. But the human spirit, that becomes the old man. And has to be crucified. He is not, it isn't transformed. If it was transformed, it wouldn't have to be crucified. So you've got to, got to see this. But the human spirit, it is I got to be crucified. That's your old person. That's, it has to be crucified. And the new man, it's a new creation. That's got to govern this whole situation. Now, as I say, I just give that to you for your consideration, but I'm pretty, pretty convinced of it myself. But it's quite a thought. I've not ever heard anyone else say this. There, there must have been someone that's seen this beside me. But that's how I understand this to be. That's, that's how complex of a person you are. Yeah. I don't know how you could crucify self. I don't know how you would define self outside of this. Uh -huh. Now this points out, they purchased a burying place. Mm -hmm. Abraham purchased a burying place. That's something, a, we call it, I guess, a graveyard, we might call it. Mm -hmm. I'm intrigued by the way this is stated. It points out the dignity of the only form of worldly life that bears the image and likeness that, to the Almighty God. By, I mean mankind, by form of life, mankind. Man is the only created form of life that bears a resemblance and likeness to God. That alone dignifies the body in which the person lived. This likeness is not found in, in the human body alone. Yet because the body was used as a vessel, see, we have this treasure in an earthen vessel. That fact assigns some dignity to the body. Yeah. It's not to be worshipped, it's not to be treated as though it's the main part, but, and we're not talking about health here and diet. Yeah. That's not what we're talking about here. The so burial is not something that can be successfully debated with those who lack this insight. You, you just can't convince a person who's sold on the handling the body at their own discretion that, it can't be settled by arguments. It's got to be settled by insight. <clears throat> then Joseph and his brethren returned to Egypt. Now there's a lesson to be learned here. Joseph and the other Israelites that were informed and knew that they were going to be a long time in Egypt and most of them would never see Canaan again. They knew that. Because God told Abraham there are going to be 400 years in bondage and the bondage hadn't begun yet. So at least the next 10 generations are never going to see Canaan. They're going to have to live with the promise, with this promise. They're going to have to live with something they know that they wouldn't see themselves. No informed Israelite expected the promised deliverance to take place at any moment. Hmm. All right, now at this point, we touch on the way the second coming of Christ is viewed by a lot of people. They say things like this, the early church thought he was going to appear at any moment. Yeah. I'm saying that's not true. Mm -hmm. They live by faith and faith doesn't think in terms of time. Mm -hmm. They lived in prospect of Christ coming like these Jews lived in prospect of deliverance from Egypt. Can you see that? That's, that's how this works. God hasn't called us to speculate about is it going to be today, is it going to be tomorrow? But you live as though it was. Your faith, your faith projects up to the day and you live in view of that day instead of in view of now. Amen. All writings in 1 Thessalonians especially. What we call chapter four is correcting that very day. That's right. That's right. That's right. They thought he was going to come any day. He says not any day. You don't mm -hmm. think about some letter, yeah. someone forged That's letters right. every day. He didn't say that phrase not any day. But yeah. He is correcting that view. Yeah. Oh yes. He said it shall not come until. Yeah. Uh huh. That's right. Mm -hmm.
He said, that day shall not come until. Uh -huh. So that's from the time viewpoint. But hope isn't from the time viewpoint. Right. Hope is from the faith viewpoint. Amen. So we live the same way those Jews did for 400 years. We live the same way. Uh -huh. We're not, we live as though it would be tomorrow. Uh -huh. We certainly wouldn't be disappointed if it was. Yeah. But that's not, that's, see, that's not the, the way we view it. We view it, we view it by faith. Mm -hmm. It's just going to be a moment, yeah. and we'll be there. Amen. And we live with that in mind, keep our lives with that in mind. Living by faith is not living with time in mind. Yeah. It's near the end of the world. I better shape up. This is not how faith operates. Uh -huh. Yes, it probably is coming to the end of the world. We understand that, but that's not the thing that should motivate how you live. The just to live by faith. Now, in the last page here, it's a little bit clumsy, but I endeavor to put it in a kind of a chart form what I've been talking about. From a linear point of view, a progressive point of view, there's, you have this thing looking for that glorious appearing. We're, we're living our life looking, but it's above time and circumstance. Mm -hmm. We're looking way ahead yeah. to the coming of the Lord, and, and then we live accordingly. We live in view of what's yeah. going to be right. rather than what is. Uh -huh. Or now, yeah. if this is a, a true representation, mm -hmm. how right is it to always try and be solving people's problems? Mm -hmm. Now, I've been in recent uh, months paying particular note to uh, public presentations of preaching because there's trends, and I've noticed, I've come to a conclusion. It doesn't make any difference who we're talking about in the, I'm talking about public. Not who we're talking about, they take the scripture, and some of them faithfully represent the scripture, but the bottom line is, what does this have to do with you? Yeah. Uh -huh. Every single person I hear, and it's getting worse, that's the heart of their message. The heart of their message is you. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Amen. But that's not the heart of the gospel message. Amen. You are not the focus. Yeah. And see, if you... If people are always saying that you can have a good life, you can have a better life, God can solve your problems, and blah, 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 then all of a sudden that's coming of the Lord kind of pales into the background and is not significant. So that is not what valid preaching is all about. That is not what the church is all about. The church is not out here to make the world a better place to live or to help people with all of their problems and iron things out for them and teach them how they can have happy homes and have good finances and all that may sound good, but it's terrible because it all minimizes Christ. That's not why Jesus came. That's not why he died. And the focus has got to be on Christ and God and the gospel and things faith can get hold of. Mm -hmm. Yes, we want God's people to live properly in this world and to have what they're able to handle. We wish we desire that for other, for other people. But that is not enough to dictate how you live. Any more than the Israelites could maintain their life for 400 years in Egypt thinking about and only thinking about the tribulation. They had to think about getting out of there. And finally their cries come up to God and I get an idea that people begin to calculate it out. Hey, hey it's, it's been about 400 years. And we hear about the Amorites, we hear that things getting pretty bad over there in Canaan. There had to be some people that kind of figured out this is about the time. They poured out their souls to God and God heard them. Yeah. I think that's all I have for you tonight, but Amen. there certainly is. A, I'm not a person that likes a theological pattern when doctrine is. is is concerned 
But it seems like in these accounts in Scripture, there is sort of a moral or spiritual pattern that's embedded in it, like what it means to live by hope. It means to stay in Egypt for 400 years knowing that Israel's coming out, and I may not be among those. I may not be alive and remain when he comes, so to speak, but I'm going to live in view of that Amen. coming. Amen. Any of you have a word you'd like to add tonight? Yes, Brother Jason. The, uh, Joseph and all of his family traveling all those Egyptians <laughs> to bury, it reminded me of a couple of principles in scriptures. It says, we're, we're in the world, but we're yeah. not of the yeah. world. So there's, there's Joseph. They're in Egypt. They're <laughs> not of Egypt. <laughs> but they're not of Egypt. No. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not like the world, but we are. Jesus said, you're, you're salt and you're light in yeah. the world. So we're, we're to have an influence. Yes. Mm -hmm. Amen. And we do. Actually, God's people do. Mm -hmm. Yes. Have an influence on, on other people. Just as Joseph and his family had an obvious influence on the Egyptians in that uh, in that account. Amen. Mm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yeah, I don't know how this fits in, but I was thinking about it when you're talking about the burial site there. You know, it, 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 for for a long time, every time I, I read some accounts of old cemeteries and people had a respect for the dead yeah, and they had a respect for they come across a cemetery they wouldn't dream of digging it up or des de de desecrating the bodies but this is not this yeah. is there's a change yeah. going on out there it's people do not respect the dead like they once did yeah. and um it's just you know i don't know how that fits into this but i i, I get the picture that god protected the burial site of abraham isaac yeah. and jacob that god they didn't like have guards sitting there I you know how did they know when they got there it was even going to be there? Yeah. It wasn't hadn't somebody hadn't stolen them. So they they didn't. God had protected yeah. it, and so anyway, I just I just I can see that um, obviously that he, Joseph let out Jacob, just as though it, they had guards sitting yeah. there. Yeah, several centuries, mm -hmm. seven or eight centuries after David died, Peter said on Pentecost, "His sepulcher is with us to this day." Yeah. Uh -huh. How about that? <laughs> Even after the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, mm -hmm. the sepulchre was still there. Still yeah. there. Yeah. Yes, sir. Judah. When you live by faith, it enables you to look, look under the glorious coming of the day of Christ. And it also takes the ability to look for anything else. Yeah. Because mm. if you're truly looking unto the day of his glorious appearing, then everything you do will be thrust toward that. But when you start looking at yourself and you become the center of your own little world, that's when the living by faith stops. That's right. But when you live by faith and look under the day of His glorious appearing, that's when all that you do is unto the Lord and unto in, in view of judgment in that day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Just Amen. a Maddie? Yeah, um, you were saying that the Israelites, when they it was they were done burying Israel, and they were to go back to Egypt now. That that uh, some of them knew of the hardship that was to come, but they went back anyway because that was that was what they were to do. And I was reminded of uh, what Paul said to the shipmen when they were in the they were in that storm that that was a great tempestuous wind. And the ship was being broken apart, and these shipmen, they were trying to flee out yep. of the ship. And Paul said, yeah, except ye abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. That's uh, right. And Amen. It, in Christ, there are going to be times when we can see difficulty coming. Mm -hmm. But if we're cowards and we try to flee from the difficulty, mm -hmm. then we won't be able to partake of the, the, the um, benefit of being a victor. If we try to escape from from difficulty, then we won't we won't be victorious through fighting. And so I wanted Amen. I I was thankful to be able to see that that um, the Lord gives us grace to be able to not flee from in the face of difficult circumstances. Amen. 
Yes. I don't know if this is a, 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 a the best metaphor or not, but I, I, I wanted to share this. It came to my mind. We're talking about the soul and the spirit and the body and the resurrection of the body. I, I was listening to an Anglican preacher a few months ago on mm. the Internet. And he was trying to explain these things, and he said... Uh, this is hard to explain to modern people because we've lost touch with this spiritual language. Uh -huh. So he said, here's how you can think about it. You've got software and you've got hardware. <laughs> and God is able to download your software onto some new hardware. <laughs> I thought that was a good uh -huh. explanation. <laughs> yes, I was thinking about this extended time of mourning that the people had in the time of death. And there had to have been a lot of considerations and meditations about death itself, the effects of death, mm -hmm. what was after death, how it affected all of these things had to have been being thought about during this time of mourning. And Brother Bob mentioned this, but I, I see in our culture that there is, isn't this anymore. Mm -hmm. There is there is as quickly as possible taking care yeah. of the necessities at yeah. the time mm -hmm. of death and then moving on very mm -hmm. quickly. Yes. And there's a lot missed yes. because they don't spend time thinking about right. these things mm. surrounding yes. death mm -hmm. anymore. Very good. Yeah. Amen. Amen. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this record and for the faith of these patriarchs. This is the type of faith, Father, we want to have that lives in anticipation of what you're going to do. Yes. We thank thee that you have revealed so much to us and we ask for grace to live in such a manner as to glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen.